Chapter 10 William hoisted his backpack higher up on his shoulders and walked slowly across the rough wooden planks of the drawbridge. Sir Simon embraced him at the other end, as one soldier embraces another. No matter what else happens, my boy, nothing shall erase this. You are a courageous person, a squire with the heart and soul of a knight. William nodded. He didn't dare speak yet, thinking that his voice must have shrunk with his size. Sir Simon lowered the portcullis, and William heard for the first time the squeaky clank of the chains and the deep thud of the pointed wooden spikes as they hit the ground. Come, I shall take you to her. We can raise the drawbridge later. The knight led him across the main courtyard and into the covered passageway that connected the buttery and the kitchen on one side with the great hall on the other. Can we go through this way? William asked. I could never see into this room very well from up above. My voice sounds perfectly all right, he thought. Sir Simon nodded and turned left instead of right. The walls of the large banquet hall were hung with intricate woven tapestries. Animal skins of various shapes and colors were spread along the floors. A long table flanked by two benches took up one whole wall of the large room. William peered into the fireplace, which was as big as his closet at home. Two enormous black pots hung from the hooks on one side. Up above, decorated banners were draped over the balcony rail of the minstrel's gallery, but William didn't have time to stop and study them. The knight had already disappeared up the corner staircase. He led William along the wall walk to the curved door in the opposite tower. I gave Lady Eleanor the master chamber as I sleep downstairs on the kitchen floor to guard the fire, Sir Simon explained as they stepped onto the landing. Her room is right through here, he said, indicating the door William was facing. I shall leave you now. William stood there for a long moment, listening to Sir Simon's footsteps retreating down the stairs to the kitchen. His heart was thudding in his chest. Mrs. Phillips was humming a tune that sounded vaguely familiar, and he stood for a moment more, listening, hoping it would quiet the pounding in his ears. What if she still refused to speak to him? Get it over with, he muttered to himself. He knocked. The humming stopped. Sir Simon, she called. He didn't answer, but turned the hammered metal handle of the door and pushed it open. She was seated in front of the fire with her back to the door, wearing a long blue robe covered by some sort of tunic. I came, was all he said. William, she said. She put down her needlework and stood up. This time there was no silver knight in his belt pack, and he hugged her as hard as he could his nose buried in the rough linen across her chest. She pushed him away and looked at his face for a long time. Do I look different? He asked. No, you look the same. She touched his temple with her forefinger. It's what's going on in here, I wonder about. I, I did warn you. I said I'd make you stay no matter what. She went and sat down in front of the fire again. Then why are you here now? Because I know I made a mistake. I have to go back with Sir Simon and find the other half of the token. The half that sets us free. He knew what she was thinking. What if you don't find it? But she didn't say it, and neither did he. If he'd let himself think what ifs, he would never have gotten this far. Where did you get the dress? He asked. It's actually called a surcoat, and this is a tunic. She ran her fingers along the brown cloth across the top. They were hanging in the wardrobe. This castle is very well outfitted, right down to the pots and pans in the kitchen. I brought you some supplies, he said, digging through his backpack. He handed her the jar of Marmite, the bread, and the tea bags. The sight of them made her smile for the first time in a week. They ate dinner together that night on either side of the table in the courtyard. Not quite under the stars, Sir Simon said, but one gets the same feeling. William looked up past the tower walls to where the attic ceiling should have been, but he couldn't quite make it out. I'm glad you remembered to leave the lamp on when you came up to the drawbridge, Sir Simon said. The light bulb will burn out eventually, William said, but I brought candles and matches in my backpack. And Marmite, Mrs. Phillips said with a smile. And good bread, said the knight, tearing off another piece. William suddenly felt happy to be there with the two of them see them laughing over a joke together at the same table. I I'm glad I came, he said. 
They each reached out and took one of his hands. It took courage, said Sir Simon. But you will need more for the days ahead, he stood up. Tomorrow, my boy, your training begins in earnest. The next morning, the three of them gathered in the courtyard after a hasty breakfast. First, William was provided with the uniform and weapons of a squire, which Sir S the Silver Knight had found in the armory. According to this riddle, you must cross the drawbridge as a squire. I will start your training now, Sir Simon explained. He dropped a brown cloth tunic over William's head while muttering some odd incantation. Then he fastened a belt around his middle, complete with a soft leather bag and a small, sharp dagger in its scabbard. What were you whispering? William asked. The words my father said over me when I became a knight. Rules of conduct we must respect, be we knight, squire, or page. Tell me what they are, William said. Be compassionate to the needy, neither squander wealth nor hoard it. Never lose your sense of shame. If questions are asked of you, answer them frankly, but do not ask too many yourself. Be manly and of good cheer. Never kill a foe who has begged for mercy. You've forgotten one, Sir Simon, said Mrs. Phillips, who was standing on the side watching the two of them. What is it, my lady? Be ever loyal in love, she said. The Silver Knight smiled at her. Oh, yes, but in that one quality, William is not lacking, he said. Certain things bear repeating, she replied simply. Ah, as you wish, my lady. They divided his training. Sir Simon taught him how to use his dagger, how to improve the speed of his footwork, how to keep his weapons in good order, how to load and fire a crossbow, dress and arm his lord, Sir Simon. As it was believed that a knight's strength increased until midday and then waned with the sun, Sir Simon worked with William in the morning, and Mrs. Phillips drilled him in the afternoon. They played chess and backgammon. She made him practice his recorder. Music will calm the beast in man and nature and she put him through his gymnastics exercises. Do it again. The round off wasn't tight enough, she said one afternoon. They'd moved the table off to the side of the courtyard to make room for his tumbling. Sir Simon sat in one corner watching while he sharpened the blade of his dagger. You're tougher than Robert, William complained as he returned to the starting position. Did you go to practice last week? Yeah, but Robert said I wasn't paying attention. He wanted you to come back. She smiled. You could have brought me in your pocket. Wouldn't Robert have been surprised to see that? There's something else. One day last week, he took me aside at the end of the practice, and his face was all serious, and he said, William, when you do gymnastics, you have to be honest about everything you do in the other parts of your life, too. Otherwise, your body will deceive you, and you won't be able to turn the tricks. What do you think he meant by that? she asked with a smile. The thing I'd done to you must have been showing through in the floor routine. It's kind of creepy that my own body would give me away like that. She didn't answer. So William did the exercise again. Round off, two back handsprings, Arabian dive roll. Bravo, cried the knight, putting down his dagger to clap. Sir Simon, cautioned Mrs. Phillips, please hold your applause until we're finished. It distracts William, and he needs to concentrate very hard right now. Sir Simon went back to his work, looking embarrassed. William smiled to himself. He was glad to see that somebody else was getting in trouble for a change. Mrs. Phillips had been very hard on him all week. Now, William, listen to me. I want to alter the routine a bit. The beginning will be the same. Round off two back handsprings, then come out of the second back handspring and do an Arabian forward somersault instead of the dive roll. You mean a front flip at the end? She nodded. He didn't bother to ask why. He knew she would fix him with that steely glare of hers and refuse to answer. On the first try, he fell in the middle of the front somersault. You weren't concentrating, she said. Your mind was still telling you to do the dive roll. You need to put both mind and body into it. I'll spot you for the front somersault this time. Tomorrow you'll do it on your own. He was able to execute it perfectly, knowing that her outstretched arm would be there to support his back. That's enough for today, she said at last. William glanced over at Sir Simon, 
who raised his fist in a silent cheer behind her back. When she saw the direction of William's eyes, she turned around, but Sir Simon's head was bent close to his work again. What's all this rehearsing for? William finally asked her after the third day. You will never be able to defeat the wizard with brute strength, she said. Let Sir Simon challenge him openly if he wants. You will have to depend on your brain and your footwork. I don't know which of those weapons you will need to use, but all of them must be sharpened, just as Sir Simon sharpens his dagger. And why the change in the routine to the front flip? He asked. Another weapon, she replied. You'll get back on your feet a little faster that way. At the end of the week, Sir Simon declared that they were ready. He and William would leave at dawn. I will spend the night alone in the chapel, as I did before I became a knight. At daybreak, you must come to me, William, and help me dress. After the knight left, William and Mrs. Phillips sat in her room for a long time. In the quiet of the evening, he held himself still, listening for the world outside the castle. The world of the attic, of his house, the traffic going by on the main road. But he couldn't hear anything. Do you think it's still there? He asked her. Our old world, I mean? I'm not sure. Will we ever get back? That depends on you. Can you come with me? He asked, the question that had been at the back of his mind all week. I still need you to spot me for that final flip. Remember what Robert once said to us when he first taught how to spot you? Put your hand out and support him lightly, Mrs. Phillips. Allow William to feel the skill in all the parts of his body. You will keep him safe, but he will do the trick. She shook her head. You must find your own way through the forest, William. That's what I've been trying to tell you all along, in this world and our old one. Come, stand here by me. She was seated in front of the fire, doing the same needlework he'd seen her with the first afternoon. He'd never looked at it closely before. What is it? He asked. A fire screen, but that isn't important. Look at the picture. William leaned closer. I see a man. There's someone with him, someone smaller, and some trees. Her finger touched the man and then the smaller person. A man and a boy setting out on an adventure. Into a forest. She glanced up at him. Remember the motto? When the lady doth ply her needle and the lord doth test his sword, when the squire shall cross the drawbridge, remember? He nodded silently, although he'd forgotten the exact words. There are rules in the world of magic, just as there are in our world. Everything has its place. Directions must be followed. Each person is given the right weapon. Mine is a needle and thread. Will I be all right? He asked. You're always asking me that question, William. Now I shall ask you, will you be all right? He didn't answer, but went over and stood by the narrow window looking out at the darkness. Tomorrow and the next day and the day after, where would he be? What would he meet? I wish you'd never given me the castle. Then you'd be in England and I'd be at home. But now that everything's in place, I am ready to go. For the first time, the answer came from somewhere deep inside him, and he believed it. And whatever happens, you must remember one thing, she said, that you have within you the weapons you need, the heart and soul of a knight and the body of a squire. No other weapon will ever serve you as well as that knowledge. That night, he slept in her room on a straw pallet in front of the fire. When he woke, she was already dressed. She helped him adjust his tunic and slid the soft leather bag along the belt till it hung above his right hip. It seemed heavier, he said, exploring its lumpy exterior with his fingers. There's some food in there and your recorder and your binoculars. I guess I can't take bear, he said. Your hands must be free and he's too large to fit in the bag. Anyway, I'll need some company in this drafty old castle. Now go see to Sir Simon, she said, crushing him in a quick hug. I'll meet you in the courtyard. William slipped both hands through the metal ring of the chapel door and pulled. 
He didn't see Sir Simon at first. He stood at the back, accustoming his eyes to the flickering light of the altar candles and his nose to the sweet smell of incense. William stared for a long time. At last he saw Sir Simon in the shadows, lying face down in the main aisle that led to the altar, arms outstretched. William stayed quiet, waiting. After what seemed like hours, the body moved and Sir Simon clambered slowly to his feet. He passed the squire with a nod, which William took to mean he was to follow him in silence. Sir Simon seemed quieter after his night of fasting and prayer. William remembered his instructions from the week before. First the quilted vest and cap to protect the knight from the hard edges and the weight of his own armor. Then the chainmail shirt with the hood that fastened behind the ears. William had to stand on a stool in order to tie the strings tight enough to, the, to suit Sir Simon. Next, he strapped on the chest protector and the arm and shoulder guards. On top of the chainmail leggings, he fashioned shin guards to protect the knight's legs from the blow of a misdirected lance. Finally, over the knight's head, he dropped the silver tunic, decorated with Sir Simon's coat of arms, the lion flanked by a cross. My sword and helmet, William, the knight said at last. You have done well. Mrs. Phillips appeared at the side door as Sir Simon was strapping on his scabbard. I've lowered the drawbridge, she said quietly. Thank you, my lady. Since we have no priest, I would ask that you bless my sword. She stepped forward and touched the carved hilt with her fingers. Remember that you serve both God and the people. Protect this knight and his squire from any evil that seeks to harm them or keep them from their chosen path. Sir Simon bowed and slipped the weapon into its sheath. I would ask of you a keepsake, my lady. I am honored, Sir Simon, she replied, taking a long silk scarf from her neck and tying it around his forearm. And you shall have mine, he murmured as he handed her the token of Janus. This is for your protection while we are gone. Guard it well, he said, as he pressed the leather pouch into her hand. They gazed at one another for a long, solemn moment. Then he kissed her hand and turned towards the door. Come, William. William went quickly to Mrs. Phelps first. She kissed him on the forehead. You will come back, she whispered, before she pushed him gently on his way. As they walked out under the massive stone arch and over the drawbridge, William looked down and saw the muddy waters of a real moat. He reached out to stop Sir Simon and show him, but after a moment's thought, he withdrew his hand. He turned once to wave at Mrs. Phillips, who was still standing under the archway. When he glanced back for a second time, the drawbridge had been raised. <laughs>